Let them talk here at uh, the French Quarter Festival. I'm Fred Caston. Delighted to join us uh, for this uh, session with uh, two very interesting folks who are part, uh, integral part of the New Orleans music community. The uh, very talented time speaking and writer and uh, author Keith Spera and the terrific uh, trumpeter Mr. Jeremy Davenport. I want to thank uh, the folks at the. New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park and the National Park Service, the um, French Quarter Festival, Midlow Center at UNO, also the uh, Hogan Jazz Archive at uh, Tulane and the uh, Louisiana State Museum complex in which we are uh, now seated. Beautiful room, great space and a lot of fun and, and, and we actually have air conditioning as you know and flush toilets ladies and gentlemen. So, <laughs> it's the modern world up here. And uh, these, I want to hold this up. I'm holding in my hand a copy, uh, just coming out in paperback, a terrific read and a great piece of, uh, of information and history about New Orleans music. Keith Ferris, a uh, fine, fine book, Groove Interrupted, Lost Renewal and the Music of New Orleans, part of which entailed um, going behind the scenes with Jeremy on a recording session. So you'll be hearing a bit about that and uh, a lot of other interesting things. And then at the end of this, stick around because... Jeremy and the band are going to play something for you. So please enjoy and uh, welcome Keith Sparrow and Jeremy Davenport. Jeremy, nice to see you. you. In a nutshell, I wrote Groove Interrupted to answer one question. What is music in New Orleans now? What is it now? There have been plenty of books about the history of New Orleans music, where it came from, but I wanted to paint a picture of the scene in the here and now. And the way that I did that was profiling 13 individuals from across the spectrum of New Orleans music. Rappers, rockers, jazz musicians, blues guys. And in those profiles, I wanted to be uh, as intimate as possible, as, as intimate as the, the law allows. Uh, I used primarily scenes that I was there to witness uh, to, to make these profiles as vibrant as they possibly could be. So in the Fats Domino profile, I don't really talk that much about his 1950s and 1960s history. I talk about his history in the last five, six, seven years, which included a trip to New York to promote his post-Katrina tribute CD. Uh, and I tagged along for that trip. Got to see everything, him getting all angry because they cut the fat off his steak in the hotel room. Uh, uh, you know, him uh, loading up his plate at the, uh, the deli and uh, the guy, the manager, not having any idea who he was. Uh, and Fats, at least once a day on that trip, would turn to me and say, now who are you again? <laughs> like he just couldn't remember who I was or why I was there. That's the story on Fats. Uh, Aaron Neville, profile of him when he came back after Katrina for the first time to bury his wife. And he was uh, gracious enough and trusting enough of me to share what he was going through throughout that process, uh, as well as when he finally came back to play Jazz Fest for the first time after the storm. So that's the level of, of intimacy I was going for with these profiles. And those guys were all dealing with adversity. Jeremy Davenport, the subject of one of the chapters, was dealing with adversity of a different sort. Uh, Jeremy had not made a record in 10 years, not made a studio album in 10 years. And he agreed to let me be a fly on the wall in the studio while they were recording Will Dance Till Dawn, his 2009 CD on Basin Street Records. Uh, now, you know, when you get a jazz CD, you look at it, it's all perfect, it's all beautiful. Um, but the process of making it is not always quite so smooth and, and beautiful. Uh, and usually a musician doesn't want the mistakes shared with the public. They don't want to, want to let you see what goes on behind the scenes. They just want you to, to pass judgment on this final product. But Jeremy was kind enough to let me be there and record it all and, and talk about it in the book. So I guess uh, my first question for Jeremy is, uh, why? Why did you let me hang out and see you boys at work behind the scenes? Um, in, that's a good question. It's interesting because historically, um, musicians and artists hate critics and writers. And, um, and with good reason, often. Yeah. Um, but Keith, Keith comes to the table with a kind of a different set of... Um, I've enjoyed reading him over the years, and uh, and I think he always has kind of an interesting um, take in writing style. 
and I, I trust trusted you to not make me look that silly. <laughs> and uh, and so I thought it would be an interesting idea because it's the kind of stuff um, that I look to read about musicians, just kind of fly on the wall stuff, as opposed to like a real um, kind of opinionated um, take on the on the process. You just simply and it's kind of scary. You'll see when we read some of the excerpts. He basically just captured exactly what happened. In some situations, it's mildly embarrassing for me to actually read back what actually happened. And um, and, it, and for me, it was also it was cool. It was like a, it was a learning experience. But um, so yeah, I knew I knew it was going to be a a, a a win win. The scary part is though, um, similar to the facts thing, um, you were always just kind of so quiet, and obviously you knew everyone personally that was there as well. So we kind of just always forgot Keith was there every day, and, and so it really got really loose. And so at the end of the day, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> you know, be nice. <laughs> you know, so. I, I try to keep myself very skinny so I can disappear. <laughs> Hide behind a mic. Yes, exactly, behind a pot of plant or whatever. Um, well, he's backing up. We should talk a little bit about why it had taken you 10 years to make this record. And it, and it kind of plays into the, uh, the larger picture of recorded music overall and jazz music specifically. Um, is, is it, and just for those who don't know, I mean, Jeremy grew up in St. Louis, went to New York to study after high school on the advice of Wynton Marcellus and Harry Connick, came down to New Orleans to study under Ellis Marcellus here, left school to go on the road with Harry Connick, joined his big band, spent a number of years enjoying a life of wine, women, and song on the road with Harry, uh, and then left Harry's band to basically start his own thing and, and, and become a front man in his own right. And since 2000, you've been playing at the Ritz-Carlton every weekend, uh, and, and that's been the, the sort of anchor of, of your career, that's been the, the, the foundation of your career, is that gig at the Ritz. Mm -hmm. But 10 years passed between your first two studio albums on Telarc and the recording of We'll Dance Till Dawn. Uh, is it fair to say that you were kind of waiting for ambition and reality to kind of yeah, intersect? Is that, uh, um, this is an intimate group I feel very comfortable right now, sharing. Excellent. Um, no, I, the reality of it was, um, in the early the mid '90s, I was approached by Sony, and um, and so my head was really in a place that I really wanted a big deal. Deal, um, the Sony deal didn't actually uh, work out, and so I signed with Telarc, which is which is at the time was one of the biggest independent labels, but it's still huge distribution and widely respected. And so I did um, two CDs on Telarc, and. Um, and this was a different era in, in the recording, um, the time of the recording. They paid me a lot of money to do to do the CDs, um, wh where now no one pays any money to record music. <laughs> it's, 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 it's fun. Um, Welcome to a journalist life. Yeah, yeah. Yes, there you go. Um, so anyway, the bottom line was, um, I walked away from what was supposed to be a third recording with Telark with a kind of salty taste in my mouth because I didn't, I, I didn't feel like they did anything with the CDs. I just recorded these CDs and no, no one ever, it, you know, they sold okay, but they, it didn't do anything. So I was, my ego was bruised. And then when Mark Samuels, uh, I'll never forget this, I met Mark Samuels um, when I was in high school in New York. I was staying at Wynton Marsalis' house and Mark Samuels in Winton. Mark Samuels is the uh, president of Basin Street Records, sorry. Um, they were high school buddies and so Mark, we all three went to lunch and Mark at the time had a legitimate job, but he was always fantasizing about being in the music business. Anyway, when Mark had the idea to start this label, Basin Street Records, he approached me first. And at the time, I still had this notion that I was going to get some big deal, like Warner or something was going to come along. And uh, I told him no. And every year, he'd kind of revisit it. You know, we'd have lunch. Come on, let's make a record. No. Um, and then in the meantime, he picked up, you know, uh, uh, Los Hombres, mm -hmm. you know, the Headhunters, Irvin, um, Michael White, Michael White, Teresa Anderson, Kermit Ruffin, Kermit, Kermit, Kermit yep. um, John Cleary. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, you know, he picked up all these artists and finally, uh, I went to him and I'm like, man, I got to do a record. <laughs> and, uh. So we had lunch and we, we, we signed a deal and did it. And so um, the reality was, you know, the, the recording business, um, and to make a, a perfect example, my sax player is sitting here, you'll get to hear him in a minute, but he, uh, he's a guy that should have a, a recording contract and, 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 he, and 
these deals just don't exist anymore. So it's right. a it's a it's a it's a scary scary business. Making that record uh, will dance till dawn, and being there for some of the preliminary discussions about what was going on gave me a little more insight about how economics really does affect the business. Not just the business side of music, but the create the creative side. I mean, yeah. you initially wanted to do like a record with a string section and yeah. all this sort of stuff, and basically the word from Basin Street was, "No, right. can't, can't do it, can't afford it." Right. And I think we get into it on here where um, we did a song that was supposed to be one song with George Porter um, and Herman Ernest, and we started messing around, and, and another song um, came to life. And, and literally in the studio, I had to look to Mark Sanders and say, look, can we pay these guys for another song? <laughs> you know, and so he has the checkbook. So he's, he, uh, and so we end up doing the other song. So yeah, it's, 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 it's odd. The, uh, in the studio with these guys, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of joking back and forth, a lot of banter. Um, Jeremy definitely, uh, flashed his, uh, I don't know, is neuroticism the best way to put it? Is that, uh, is that Thanks, fair? Keith. Is that, uh, well, I, I've never seen an artist uh, make out an, uh, a list of songs recorded in alphabetical order before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely, you know, I think there's probably a diagnosis. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm super organized and, and um, detail-oriented, so... Um, and the funny part, and again, it talks about in the book, the first day of this recording session, you know, I showed up for the session and the studio was locked. No, no one was there yet. I was the first person there. And in my mind the night before, I'd envisioned me showing up and sandwiches and the press. People would be there waiting. <laughs> you want a gauntlet of paparazzi? Yeah, yes. Exactly. That's a locked instead, door. Instead, I'm sitting in the, in the gravel parking lot behind the music shed and it's like, 110 degrees outside and no one's no one's like there uh, it's a glamour of it all you know making the record um, one of the differences between this Basin Street record and your Telarc records on the Telarc records you were convinced that you had to play everything live you had to play with the band that was the only authentic way to do it whereas with the Basin Street record you're like you you let the band play, and then you would play your horn parts and your vocal parts right. separately. So you right. kind of real, came to a realization about why well, put that extra stress on yourself of doing it live. Right. But you relaxed a little bit about that. I, you know what? It's funny because the more we talk about this, the more I think about it. And is Mark Samuels here? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> I think I made a mistake. I should have done it the way I did my tell record. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because, uh, you know, that neurotic tendency tends to, you know, if you know you can do something over a hundred times, as opposed to on the, on the Telerk records that I recorded in New York, it was live to tape. So you were like, okay, I gotta get, I gotta get this right because I've got five guys in the room. We, we, we don't have, we don't have 10, 15 days to do this. So with, with that in mind, um, some of the, some of the material, you know, so in my mind, I thought, okay, if, 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 if I go back and redo the vocals and go back and redo the trumpet playing, it'll be perfect, which there's no such thing as that in music and art, so that's, that's a dumb idea. But I thought it was going to be better than it, than it was. And so, <laughs> so uh, but definitely buy the CD. You be the judge. <laughs> exactly. I thought it came out fine. Good, thanks. Um, well, and the other debate that I found interesting in the studio listening to these guys go back and forth is that... Uh, there was a discussion about whether or not with your solos, with your trumpet solos, do you play just the melody in the song, which is kind of the, the more listenable way, or do you try and impress people with your chops, right. with your yeah. chops, you know, being flashy and fancy and all that sort of stuff. And that is that sort of an ongoing debate for you about, you know, who, what master are you trying to serve? Every with? second, every minute of the day, it's the question of, because Louis Armstrong, who's my favorite musician, um, you know, all... Through all of his work, he always maintained this super lyrical, beautiful, melodic con conception. Even when people talk about the hot fives and hot sevens, when he was really, really playing m more of a traditional um, style, it was always very beautiful and melodic and 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 singable. And and I've always, as much as I've appreciated all the other great trumpet players, um, I always come back to that. And some of my favorite records are records that he did with the American Songbook. Where he'd sing the song, and then he would play play the melody basically on the trumpet, and that's I've always been passionate about that. And um, 
I don't think I achieved that on this record either, to be honest. <laughs> That's why I got to do, do another record. <laughs> You, you did mention that recording for you is like looking at old pictures of yourself. Yeah. You're never happy. And yeah. I think that's manifesting itself right here. We're here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's strange. I don't know how anyone in the audience feels about looking at pictures or video or hearing their voice. But it's definitely some people have different levels of comfort with it. But yeah, for me, it's all um, painful. Painful. <laughs> uh, but I'm getting over it. Good for you. Yeah. Well, that kind of ties into something else that was said during the studio, in the studio that I thought was interesting. I, I think it was the morning of the first day. That morning on OZ, you heard a, a recording of a jazz concert from the 40s. Yeah. And you kind of came in asking the question, well, you know, when did jazz stop being fun? Right. These guys in the 40s were obviously having a lot of fun. And somewhere along the way, modern jazz became this very serious, studious, you know, let's not well, have too much fun thing. Yeah, you know, it's funny because... Again, a couple of my guys from my band are here, and we, we talk about this all the time. I mean, it's a constant dialogue of, you know, do you play music, you know, do you play music for people, or do you play for yourself, or do you play, you know, it's, it's, it's very tricky. And it, I, I, I always thought, what's scary is I'm 41 years old now, and I've been thinking about this since I was probably 16. And so you, you think to yourself, when I was 16, I'm like, wow, by the time I'm 20, I'll have this all figured out, man. This will be great. <laughs> then 20, you're sitting there, yeah, 25. You know, Now I'm 41, and I'm like, it's more daunting now. I can't get my head around, you know, um, you know, what do, what do people want to hear, and what do people, um, you know, we have this thing at, at, at my club, people dance. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Um, I mean, people try to dance, but it's... <laughs> It's pretty pretty funny, but it, um, but the but the reality of it is it's it's this it's this constant. I think every artist has always played this game of, you know, the marketplace versus the art, and it's it's a it's a struggle. You know, you know, you, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, if 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 I won the Powerball and economics had nothing to do with what I'm doing, would I still be doing the same thing? And I think at the end of the day, you want that answer to be yes. You're doing what you love, and 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 that's what I'm doing. Amen. When you write music, because uh, on we'll, we'll Dance Till Dawn, you wrote five? Half, half, half of the yeah, about half the tracks. Um, and are you writing for this next record yeah. as well? Yeah. Uh, the style that you write in is very much uh, comparable to records that were made a long time ago. Right. Um, and is that the way you've always written? I mean, is that just the way you where you found your strength lies? Is that just uh, what you think, Jack? I, 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 where are you coming from? I'm com I'm coming from. I fell in love with those with the with Cole Porter and Irving Berlin and and and, and Johnny Mercer and these storytellers. You know, I, I just always embraced that 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 uh, aesthetic in songwriting. Um, I missed um, not to offend anyone or make myself sound silly, but I, I missed like the whole rock and roll thing. I, I missed it. Like yeah, I just didn't. I didn't know. <laughs> um, like I I fell in love with Ella Fitzgerald singing George Gershwin songs. And I, I never, I, that that just was like infected my brain to the point where that's that's just what I'm still really interested in that in that in that that sound and that whole flavor, and so, but it's funny because we we were just in tour in Brazil and um, that Bee Gees song came on How Deep Is Your Love, mm. are you familiar with that number? Oh, uh, interlude. Yes. yes. And so uh, I always I've always. That's I actually love that song, and so I started. We started talking about, hey, we should do that song, and it's like, and it, you know, so I started to. I'm I'm definitely exploring different eras of songwriting that I do appreciate, and I and and that's a song that, that I like, and someday we'll play it. But we should not expect to hear any rapping on your new no, CD. No, probably not. Okay, probably not. <laughs> that that that's come along since rock and roll as well. That's yeah. if you're up to speed on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> um. <laughs> I actually like like that music. <laughs> <laughs> One of the songs that you wrote for "We'll Dance Till Dawn" uh, was a lot of fun. You, with Kermit Ruffins, you right. wrote it with Kermit Ruffins in mind, Mr. New uh, Mr. New Orleans. Uh, talk a little bit about your relationship with Kermit, because on paper, you know, you guys seem like very different creatures, uh, but you guys have this interesting rapport. Uh, and that'll lead us into him being in the studio with you. But just talk a little bit about you guys' relationship. Um. I've always been a big fan of Kermit, and when I came to town in 89, he was one of the first um, people I went to hear. And so, 
he was like he represented you know obviously the quintessential kind of New Orleans trumpet player and he's a few years older than me how, how old is Kermit I don't even know late 40s yeah, yeah. so he's he's 20 years older than me and so <laughs> um, <laughs> he uh and so I just remember this, I had a really vivid memory of uh, going to hear Kermit play with the Rebirth Brass Band at, at, at uh, Maple Leaf. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming up to him afterwards and he played like for an hour, just super high and loud, like crazy trumpet playing. And so I, I you know, I took him aside and I said, you know, and again, this is 1989. And I just said, Kermit, you know, what, how do you do this? I mean, how, how, how can you maintain this, this, play that high and loud for so long, you know, and he goes, it's, he takes me over the side of the stage, he's like, it's a combination of two things. And I'm like, what? And he goes, reefer and beer. <laughs> <laughs> and so, at that moment, our, our personality is like, this guy's hilarious. I mean, so we, we hit it off, and it was, we've been good friends ever since. So, um, but we never really worked together, and to be, to be quite honest, it's been kind of a lopsided friendship in that, because of our schedules, he has a little more flexibility, and so he shows up a lot of times on my Thursday and Friday night gigs at the hotel, and we and we and we do stuff together. And so, in, instead of when I got this idea to do a duet together, um, I wanted to write a song, an original song, so I wrote the song for Kermit. All right. And so the plan was to have Kermit come in and record. I think you guys had three days in the studio. Kermit was supposed to come in on one of the first couple days. Yeah, day two, I think. And uh, he didn't show up. Come to find out, he'd gone to uh, uh, a Treme shoot. I think they were filming the uh, the pilot for the HBO series Treme, and there was a second line scene. And he wanted to go be part of that, so he couldn't come. So it was rescheduled for another day. So, uh, so that's one of the scenes in the book, and, and we've done this a couple times before, where we we'll, we're going to do a little reading from this section of the book here. Jeremy's going to do his parts. I'll do Kermit uh, poorly. I'll do Kermit poorly. Uh, but you get a little sense of the flavor, I think, and the sort of creative back and forth between these guys that led to one of the, the key tracks on the record. Uh, so you ready to read here? Let's do it. All right. So this picks up on the morning of March 20th, 2009. Granted a mulligan, Kermit Ruffins arrives on time for the rescheduled session. He and Davenport slap hands and embrace. 12, hour, 12 hours earlier, Ruffins hung with Davenport at the Ritz-Carlton before setting off for Vaughn's. What's up, dude? Had a good time last night, man. Always, always. Ruffins is as happy-go-lucky as Davenport is tightly wound. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> I speak the truth. Right? Yeah, appreciate that. Yep. Davenport wants the whole world to know his name. For Ruffins, the only world that matters is Orleans Parish. As Ruffins settles in, Davenport polishes off a trumpet solo for Almost Never, the song destined to lead off the new album. Ruffins sizes up the task at hand. He limbers up his voice and chuckles. The previous afternoon, he listened to the rough recording of Mr. New Orleans in his car. He examines a color-coded lyric sheet. You're red. No, I'm red. You're yellow. Again, Jeremy color-coded everybody's parts. Just, I mean, I'm not saying he's neurotic. I'm just saying he color-coded all the parts. I did. Um, I thought it was a good idea. Yeah. Will, uh, will they record in the same room? No, Davenport says. He will be in the isolation booth, Ruffins in the main studio. Dramatic pause. No, that's you. Oh, okay. Well, no, I was waiting to make sure you're there. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Ruffins, it's all set up? Yep. Ruffins and Davenport simultaneously. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. In front of a microphone, Ruffins makes himself at home. He removes his fedora and clamps headphones over a bandana festooned with a playing card design. He pours himself a Bud Light over ice. The first alcohol of any kind consumed during the session, and apparently half of his secret combination. <laughs> All aboard, Ruffins exclaims, his traditional prelude to any artistic endeavor. He sips iced beer, then sings, Mr. St. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't have my singing voice ready. I haven't listened to it in a while, the melody's escaping me right now. And there is a reason I review and don't do, trust me, it's because I can't sing. Mr. St. Louis, when you croon a tune, you say, ooh-wee. Right. He sips some more, positions his trumpet case on a stool, extracts his horn, blows it, consults with engineer Chris Finney on the position of the microphone, clears his throat, laughs to himself, coughs, scats, grins as Davenport, whose sense of humor Ruffins compares favorably to Jerry Lewis, clowns in the adjoining isolation booth. Jeremy's a fool, yeah. 
Ruffin sings, I said la di di da. In the isolation booth, Davenport locks his fingers behind his head and stretches. Under the watchful gaze of a Professor Longhair poster, the tape, actually just a computer's hard drive, rolls. I've got one question. How do you play those high notes? Those high notes you've referred to... Reefer! Come to my secret combination. <laughs> Ruffins cracks up. I like that. High notes you're reefer to. Davenport offers directions and good cheer. You take the high road on the harmony and I'll sing the low harmony. Let's give it a shot. Loving it. Loving it. You were a little more enthusiastic in the studio, actually. Loving it! There you go. That's better. <laughs> Ruffin's voice is even more gravelly than usual. He clears his throat loudly and often. Hands in his pockets, bouncing at the knees, he's getting into it. But he's still not sufficiently familiar with the lyrics. His delivery sounds deliberate. Let's stay together, make the people dance. Davenport answers in his smooth croon. Let's sing together. Then stops. I, I stop and then I say, I keep Effing expletive it up. It, it up. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, Ruffin says. They go again and blow it again. One more time. That was, that was perfect, except I keep messing it up. Messing it up. <laughs> they reset and restart. Ruffin snaps his fingers and nods his head as Davenport delivers the let's sing together, make the people dance harmony. Ruffin should answer him, but is silent. After a few seconds, he throws up his hands and shakes his head in frustration. I started dancing and totally forgot to sing. They reconsider Ruffin's pronunciation of fancy pants in the line, look at you, Mr. Fancy Pants, let's sing together, make the people dance. Between takes, Ruffin's improvises. I got one reefer. He laughs at his modification. I'd make that a beautiful reefer song. They go again, the sing-song lyrics flowing easier now. I got one question. Wait, what's that? How do you play those high notes? Uh, I ain't gonna tell you too much. And again. Hey, now, how about you? Cut. Ah, uh, Mr. Fancy Pants. I just totally lost that one. He finally nails it, or at least thinks he does. Oh, yeah. Davenport tries to get his attention. Actually, you know what? But Ruffins is still celebrating, still leading his own parade. <laughs> Pat me on the back and call me Shorty. Play that doghouse music. What'd you say, Jay? Well, Jay wants another take. This time they'll sing, Let's Play Together and Make the People Dance then trade two-bar trump two trumpet solos. Ruffins hoists his horn, which emits a ragged squawk. I haven't seen this horn in three days. I should have warmed up a little. Stripped down to his long sleeve t-shirt, he clears the mouthpiece. All kinds of stuff. Reefer, beer, from about a week ago. <laughs> you can say there's a recurring theme here. Um, <laughs> yeah, evidently. He squeezes out a flurry of screeches. That's my Irvin Mayfield invitation. <laughs> is there? Is there? <laughs> and riffs on the possibility of Irvin Mayfield, his good-natured rival, running for mayor of New Orleans. I'd bring the whole damn six war to vote. We get Irvin in office, ooh, we're gonna have some fun in this city. I was gonna run. I just wanted to put on my pajamas and show up the first day so they could fire me. You talk about partying, free liquor for everybody in front of City Hall, a big block party. Their detour into mayoral politics exhausted. They get back to work. They solo on either side of a thick pane of glass, listening to one another through headphones. There is a natural bounce and swing that they're playing, a reflection of their easy rapport. Let's do a couple more just for fun. It feels good. They revisit the lyrics. Davenport suggests changing on top of Canal Street, a reference to his gig at the Ritz-Carlton, to In the Vucare. Ruffin still hopes to recast Mr. New Orleans as a reefer song. If we didn't have Jeremy here, it'd be a whole other thing. <laughs> of course, Jeremy being the whole point why they were there. Um, Davenport sings to Ruffins. You're always looking sharp in a sexy hat. You make the little lady's hearts go pitter pat. Ruffins replies, look at you, Mr. Fancy Pants. Let's sing together, make the people dance. Nice, man. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> I am not quitting my day job, trust me. <laughs> Davenport points out the twist in the final lyric. Just remember, on the way out, we're going to sing Let's Play Together, because that's into the trumpet solo. Sounds good. You want to do one more pass for safety and then... Let's do it. All aboard. They take another swing, which is to everyone's satisfaction. Ruffins pulls on his button-down shirt and fedora, 
in barely an hour, they're done. That was some fun stuff. That was good stuff. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's going to be great. And we're going to leave all the good... Laughter? Yeah, all that. We're going to leave it all in. That's good stuff. And they did. And it came out really right. I mean, the song, I think, is, is, a, is a highlight of the record. What was the, the one uh, reviewer that I cited called it? A, uh, a dry martini of an album. How does that make you feel? Uh, I don't drink martinis, so I... I, don't. I guess you, that's a compliment. You have a Davenport teeny named at you yeah. after you at the hotel. Yeah, I don't drink it, though. <laughs> well, there you go. Anyway, there's a little taste of, uh, of what it was like to be in the studio with these guys. And uh, from that, a jazz album was born. So um, I think, uh, should we play a little or are we going to take a little questions? And I guess we can feel a couple questions and then Jeremy and these guys are going to play a little bit, maybe something from the record or, uh, or something else. Um, does anyone have anything? Yes. Uh, I, I like this last record as much as the Telloc record. Oh. But my question is this. Do you play the lottery and what numbers do you use? <laughs> I'm glad you like the record, and I don't. I don't gamble, or play the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> of course, what's the joke? How do you uh, end up with uh, ten thousand dollars in the music industry? Hmm. You start with twenty thousand. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so in a way, you gamble. I hope just... Mark Samuels isn't here. This is not fun. <laughs> this is not funny. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes. You mentioned that in terms of the economics, it's changed quite a bit to where you might used to get some uh, substantial money up front to record. Mm -hmm. The cause of that, is it because music is no longer on an album or a CD basis because of the internet or it's more competition? Or what accounts for the record labels not trusting the musicians who they hope to profit from? I think it's, it's a multifaceted situation. One, uh, when I started recording music, the, the recording studio itself was this... Um, it, it was a strange place. There weren't many studios anywhere. Now, on a laptop in your living room, you can create a CD. And so the, the business of actually recording music has changed. And then the business of actually buying the music, as you know, you mentioned, has changed. Um, I don't have a real strong opinion on, on it because uh, it's, a sad, it's a sad state of affairs, but I can't tell you the last time I went into a, a CD store. I buy all my music digitally. And I think it's... I'm not afraid of that trend as long as the commerce part works. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I don't. I don't think it's a bad thing. It's. It's. It's a shame that I have so many great memories of going into record stores as a kid with my folks, but now it's. It's just changed so much. You know. I mean, in my pocket, I've you know a thousand songs, and that it's. 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 It's a crazy thing. So, um, you know, in the old days, they'd write you this big check, and then you'd make this record, and then. They work like heck to make their money back. Now it's a little different. It's a strange, it's a strange uh, situation. It's it's. We could talk about it for hours. There's not really one thing, but it, it just lends itself to this kind of very um, odd uh, place we're in right now. Well, it was interesting when we were in the studio. Somebody got a text from uh, from Jazz Sawyer, a musician who's in New York, who just found out that the uh, the Big Virgin Mega Store in Times Square just closed. Right. So when you're making a record. You really don't want to get news in the middle of it that like a major you know record stores are closing all over the place. It's like where well, are we going to sell this? Well, thing, just yeah. look in 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 New Orleans. Like in the last ten years, let's say we had we had a Virgin, we had um, Tower, yeah. Tower. Yeah. We had we had um remember the sound warehouses that were like on every block. Mm -hmm. Um, we had uh the thing that the the funeral home which Borders. is now Borders. Yep. Yep. And it's sad. I mean, it's 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 scary, but that's you know. It, Everything is, is it's market driven. I mean, in, in, if no one's buying anything, you can't keep the lights on, and it's it's sad. Which is one of the good things for you and for other jazz musicians that have a regular gig. I mean, yeah. you, you make your living by playing music, not necessarily <coughs> recording it, unless yeah. you license songs to movies and TV shows, and that's yeah. a nice little side yeah, piece of business. Yeah, it's not it's nice to to have the ability to sell. I mean, my CD is in every single guest room, and that's like eight hundred rooms, which is helpful. And it's positioned rather strategically uh, next to the. Uh... It's in the it's in the mini bar. It's hilarious. I, <laughs> and it's <laughs> seriously, I can't make this up. It's in this basket, and it's like there's there's a uh, juju beads, um, cashews, my CD, and the intimacy kit, <laughs> <laughs> which which I love. It is quite a romantic CD. <laughs> yes, so, I mean that's uh, you know maybe that is the appropriate positioning kit. for yeah, your. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're part of the pod. Honey, let's have some cashews. <laughs> let's see the jazz. You guys are nice. <laughs> Is 
that a thousand songs in your pocket? Are you glad to see it? Uh, okay. Any other songs? I'm looking through the spotlights here. To, to, or any other questions? Anyone else? Well, you want to uh, get you guys up and, sure. and, and play a little bit? Yeah. So. This song, we've done this um, routine together a thousand times around the world. At, no, we haven't. <laughs> we've done it a few times um, locally, and usually I just play the song, the, the Kermit song on the trumpet, and it's it's really not effective without Kermit, and so um, I'm going to have my sax player sing the song with me. And no, he's not. But <laughs> I just want to see if he punched mean. me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we're gonna do another song off the the CD, and hopefully, uh, you know, you'll you'll listen to the song and let me know what you think, the Kermit song. But um, we're gonna do a a great old classic song called "Come Rain and Come Shine." Hope you like it. Is this one you're happy with from the record? Uh, oh, I love this. Very good. All right, very good. This is uh, Aaron Fletcher on alto sax and Barry Stevenson on the bass. Thank <laughs> you. 
This is the only circumstances under which I should be allowed on the same stage as jazz musicians while they're playing. Like, I have no business being up there for any other reason. So, thank you very much. That was great, guys. Great. Another round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause, please, for Mr. Jeremy Davenport and Mr. Keith Sparrow. We're going to wrap this. It's just out in paperback. We'll dance till dawn. It's available at uh, Better. Paperback. Uh, uh, it's out in paperback. The CD. It's, not uh, no, the, uh, it's a, uh, available at better cyberspace locations everywhere. 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 Yes, everywhere. And uh, there will be a pop quiz later, so you need your assignments to get one of these and one of those, and we'll be talking about that. Thanks a lot, guys, and uh, Aaron yeah. Fletcher, Barry Stevenson, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Coming up in just a few minutes, Greg Garland's bassist George Porter. Stick around for that. <laughs>